chapter six is all about blood, which makes sense because we just in lab did blood typing. For those of you on Zoom, I'm gonna share this whiteboard really quick. It's exactly what I have written up on the board here in class. Chapter five, your assignment for that is due on Monday. Lots of time to do that. We talked about that stuff on Monday. Today's lecture assignment will be due on a week from today, so October 2nd. On lab on Wednesday, we'll be doing DNA extraction, um, which will be really cool. You'll get to kind of see your own DNA. We precipitate it out, which is really cool. Monday and Friday, so the last couple of chapters, we've been going in order. We went one, two, three, four, five, six. So we're not doing seven and eight on Monday and Friday next week. We're going to be doing 21 and 22. So it's just a little bit out of order. I'm just keeping along those lines of what we're talking about and doing in lab. All right. And I can always bring that whiteboard back up again at the end of class if you guys didn't get a chance to screenshot that or write it down for those of you on Zoom. Okay, chapter six, here we go. This is probably one of the best pictures they put. You know, sometimes it's like a baby and we're talking about the cardiovascular system and you're like, I don't get it. Um, but this picture actually is what we're going to be talking about today. This is um, a picture of some red blood cells. Um, and you can also see some of them that are misformed, which are really cool. So normally we have the red blood cells, they're like a disc shape. They kind of look like a thicker Frisbee. And the one on the top left there is kind of sickled. And we're going to talk a little bit about sickle cell anemia. We're going to talk about anemia. We're going to talk about leukemia, all these memias. Um, hopefully you guys find it somewhat informative. I'm not going to spend my time, though, reading all these points to ponder, like I say every week. These are just kind of like, what are we going to talk about? When you go to study for your exam, these are great questions to ask yourself, maybe without looking at the answers. So what are the functions of the blood? So you've got three functions. It helps you regulate your body functions. We talked about that with homeostasis. Your blood helps you maintain your body temperature. So if you're too cold or you're too hot, you kind of want to be just like the three bears, just right. It helps with your water and your salt balance. So maybe if you've ever felt like a cramping in your, your leg or your foot, Usually it's because you're either dehydrated or you don't have enough salt in there, but the contraction of your muscle that is making that kind of weird pain, maybe in your foot or your ankle or your calf, that cramping, it comes from that water salt balance in your blood vessels and from your blood. It also helps with your body pH. We talked about pH before, whether something is acidic or basic, and it's on that scale between zero and 14. We want to not be at, at a certain pH in our bloodstream. We know that our stomach acid is fairly acidic. Remember, it was like two to three on the pH scale. Your stomach is acidic so that it can break things down. We don't really want our blood to be very acidic because we don't want things to break down in that area. Um, another thing your blood does is it helps against defense. So it uh, helps against invasion of pathogens. It also can help with um, external invasions like getting a paper cut or you know if you accidentally scrape your knee on the ground or something like that from falling your blood will help with platelets and we'll show that in a little bit kind of mend that um, abrasive I guess you could say defense mechanism that allows it to protect your body and last, it transports oxygen, nutrients, waste, carbon dioxide, hormones. Think of it as like the railroad system of your body, right? When you take a deep breath in, all that oxygen is coming in and it quickly gets distributed throughout your body. Hopefully you guys keep doing that throughout the day, taking deep breaths, nutrients and waste. So when you eat good food or you have things that your body doesn't need, your blood system helps you to get those nutrients into the, what we need and the waste that we don't need, the carbon dioxide. So when we breathe in oxygen, we are releasing carbon dioxide through our mouth or nose. <sighs> Can't see it because I have a mask on, but that carbon dioxide gets carried away from our body by our bloodstream and through our lungs and out 
through your nose, your mouth. And then hormones, estrogen, testosterone, um, noepinephrine, epinephrine, serotonin, um, all of these different types of hormones get carried through our bloodstream and they communicate with each other, which affects some external things or some bodily function. So those are the functions of the blood. That'd be a really great question. Very straightforward for a quiz or an exam. What is blood made of? So what's the composition of blood? So blood is a fluid connective tissue. If you remember back to the day when we talked about the connective tissue, you had the supportive, the fluid, and the fibrous connective tissue. Blood is a fluid connective tissue. It is made up of formed elements that are produced in the red bone marrow. Okay, so this is in your bone, kind of towards the end of your compact bone near the spongy part of your bone is where the red bone marrow is made and we make these three formed elements. The red blood cells are abbreviated by RBC, white blood cells, WBC, you can also call those erythrocytes or leukocytes, and then platelets or thrombocytes. Normally, I refer to them by their first name, but if you ever see that in the book or things like that, those are what it means. Maybe you've heard of somebody donating plasma or you have donated plasma before, but plasma, it consists of 91% of water and 9% salts and ions and organic molecules. This is the matrix or that fluid substance that the blood cells are in. Plasma proteins are the most abundant organic molecules. A lot of people or people who have immune deficiency diseases need plasma. So that's why they have plasma donation centers and why plasma is super important um, to make sure that people who don't have the ability to fight off infections as well and things like that can get that through a donation or another source. There are three types of plasma proteins. So the proteins in your plasma that help with different functions. The first one is the out the albumins, these are the most abundant, most important. They are important for osmotic pressure as well as transport. So that osmotic pressure, that word just kind of means um, the pressure of the water on the inside of your blood cells. And we talked about that a little bit when we were talking about the capillaries and um, whether or not there was pressure on the inside or the outside of your capillary walls and how it, that pressure affects whether there's more water or salt on the inside of that cell. So this is really important, this protein is, to maintain the correct osmotic pressure at the right time. If you ever get confused about this word, remember the word osmosis? The word osmosis meant the transport of water from a high to a low concentration. This has the same root word, osmotic, and then pressure is just kind of like adjusting on the inside of that um, the, the walls of your capillaries, your veins, or your um, arteries. The globulins, so this is also important for transport, and then fib fibrogen fibrogenin, I can never say that right, fibrogenin, fibro, fibro, fibrinogen, there we go, fibrinogen, that's a hard one to say out loud. It is important for the formation of the blood clots, and we'll talk about blood clots. Maybe you've heard of somebody or you've had somebody who has trouble with blood clots and then maybe wear those kind of um, those compression socks and things like that that help prevent swelling and blood clots. Maybe somebody who has a history of blood clots also takes a blood thinner. But blood clots are important, but sometimes we, we don't need them. For example, you don't really want a blood clot when you don't have like a cut on your arm. But if a, you have a blood clot because you're bleeding, your platelets come to that area, they clot the blood. That's why if you have a cut on your arm, you put apply pressure in some sort of maybe bandage or tissue. And that kind of helps solve and um, clot that area to prevent you from continuing to bleed. It's also why when people are on blood thinners, they bleed for a little bit longer. So where do these formed elements come from and what are they? Remember the formed elements are the red blood cells, the white blood cells, and the platelets. So it, let's see here if I can zoom in so you guys can see this a little bit better. First zoomed in on the platelets. 
Yeah, we're gonna go like this so that you guys can. Oops. No. That works. This is also in your book on page 115 for those of you in the classroom that are having a hard time seeing it. So first we want to know where those red blood cells are found. So they are found from the erythroblasts, which kind of makes sense if we're calling these erythrocytes. Yeah, you guys have a hard time seeing that. Um, then we have the different types of white blood cells that come from stem cells, which are in the middle. There's different types of white blood cells and they're listed there. Lymphoblast, monoblast, and meloblast. They make lymphocytes, monocytes, and then the melanoblasts make the neutrophil, erythinophil, and the blastophil. And they're important for different things. Uh, let's see here. There's what those look like. They're important, mainly red or white blood cells are important for fighting off infections. They have helper T cells. They fight off the sickness, the foreign invaders, things like that of your blood and of your body. And then lastly, the platelets are the, um, they come from the megacaroblasts and they are also called the thrombocytes and they aid in blood clotting. Now remember there's a difference between good blood clotting and bad blood clotting. I kind of say bad blood clotting. And you want blood clotting if you have a cut on your arm or your finger or things like that so that you can prevent losing blood, unwanted blood. Blood clotting in your legs maybe or in your extremities because you have a hard time, um, maybe some plaque buildup, cholesterol, things like that. That's where blood clotting is not good is when you're clotting in your normal blood vessels and it's preventing the transport, the defense, things like that, the communication throughout your body. So again, this is figure 6.1 in your book on page 115. All right, so the structure of red blood cells is important to their function. So red blood cells, they lack a nucleus and really don't have very many organelles. Remember the organelles are like your mitochondria, your rough endoplasmic reticulum, your Golgi apparatus, they do not have a nucleus. The shape, which we'll show in a picture on the next slide, is important because it increases the surface area. We talked about the, the surface area to volume ratio and why when we have a bunch of millions of little itty bitty cells, we're able to move nutrients in and out and waste in and out of the cell effectively and the most efficient, right? It's instead of having just one big red blood cell, we have millions and millions of red blood cells. This bioconcave shape, so it kind of looks like an upside down frisbee almost, or a little, I guess it depends which way you're looking at it. It looks like a frisbee. It increases the surface area, and it's important for the efficiency of carrying the oxygen throughout the body and the carbon dioxide out and the waste out. Each red blood cell contains about 280 million hemoglobin molecules that bind three molecules of O2 each. And I can't do the math. That's a little bit too big of numbers there for me. But that's a lot of oxygen molecules that are on one red blood cell. And we'll talk about what um, anemia means in a little bit or if someone is anemic. Um, we'll talk about some of those disorders of the red blood cells later in the slides. But this is really important to understand that there's hemoglobin molecules on the outside of a red blood cell, and that's what the oxygen molecules are attached to, and you need iron in order to make that attachment, which is why someone could be called iron deficient and why it's affecting them and their red blood cells and the way that their oxygen is carried throughout their body. So here's just a little bit more about that structure of the red blood cell and why it's important. So on that far left, you have a picture of the red blood cells. You can see that bioconcave shape. It kind of looks like a Frisbee. Um, there's a, the reason this shape is the way it is is because of the way it can effectively move nutrients in and waste out of the cell. It's why it's not a square and why it's not looking like a football or it doesn't look like perfect round, this shape is important, okay? In the middle, this is kind of showing that hemoglobin molecule 
And then those red little dots that kind of look like planets, those are iron. And the iron is what helps um, with the hemoglobin, which is what the oxygen is bound to on the outside of those red blood cells. So when somebody is iron deficient, it's because, well, they can also be called anemic. And being anemic, maybe somebody gets really dizzy or lightheaded, especially with strenuous activity, but it doesn't necessarily mean just strenuous activity. Somebody who's anemic would then take some iron supplements most likely. These iron supplements, the iron is what helps bind the hemoglobin to the oxygen. So if we're not able to bind the oxygen to the hemoglobin, we're not able to get the oxygen to the extremities of the body, which is why somebody who's anemic feels dizzy, dizzy lightheaded, vision kind of comes in and out a little bit. The oxygen's just not getting to where it needs to go. And last, that picture there is a blood capillary. So we talked about where the capillaries are, the capillary bed, the thing that looks like a bird's nest a little bit, and um, how the red blood cells are being transported through there and how they can also be seen to be leaving the capillary just a little bit there in the middle and also here on the side. And moving on to get that oxygen to the rest of the extremities. Oops, okay. So the next we're talking about carbon dioxide and how it's transported. Carbon dioxide is initiated by CO2. When we have CO2 and water, like it says in this chemical reaction here, we make carbonic acid, which also can be broken down into a hydrogen ion and a bicarbonate ion. You do not need to memorize this scientific chemical reaction formula here. But what you may need to know is how the different carbon dioxide is transported throughout the body. So 68% is transported as bicarbonate ion. So it's transported as this, it's an ion, it's charged, okay? It has a, a net charge, whereas water does not have a net charge. Carbon dioxide does not have a net charge, but this is carried in the plasma. This conversion takes place inside of the red blood cells. The hemoglobin in red blood cells then has 25% of that hemoglobin or of the carbon dioxide. So 93% so far of the carbon dioxide has something to do with red blood cells. It's either in as a bicarbonate ion in the plasma, which this conversion takes place in the red blood cells, but the hemoglobin in the red blood cells has 25% of that carbon dioxide being transported outside of the body. 7% is just plain old carbon dioxide, which you guys can't really see here. Normal carbon dioxide, and that's just in the plasma. So majority of it, the 68% is transported as a bicarbonate ion that's charged. So we talked about the red bone marrow and that the production of red blood cells happens in the red bone marrow. This is inside of your bone. It is near the spongy end of your bone. I believe there's a picture on the next slide. The red bone marrow or the red blood cells that are produced have a lifespan of about 120 days. We talk about how cells develop from new cells and that we're constantly regenerating cells throughout our body. I quiz you guys this on every single, almost every single day, but which type of cells in our body do not regenerate? Nerve, nerve, nerve cells. cells, yeah. So those are, that's why nerve cells are super important, um, that they're protected, they do not rejuvenate. Red, red blood cells, on the other hand, you're getting new red blood cells every 120 days. Now it doesn't just mean that on the 120th day, everything just flips. It's a gradual process. So each individual red blood cell has a lifespan of 120 days, but they're all at kind of different times. I guess it doesn't, you can't really feel it just on the 120th day. It's like, bam, I got some new red blood cells today. The erythropoietin, this is secreted by the kidney cells and it moves the red bone marrow when oxygen levels are low. So, our body has some types of mechanisms to maintain life if our um, resources are low. 
This is why you can bring somebody back after giving them CPR or um, resuscitating them. Our body can still function, not forever, but for a short period of time, even when the resources are low. So this EPO is secreted by the kidneys and moves to that red bone marrow when the oxygen levels are low to continue to produce and try and pump blood throughout the body. The old cells are then destroyed by the liver and the spleen. I think of your liver as your detox center, right? That's why you're like, oh, my poor liver on a Saturday <laughs> night, right? But your liver is what is going in your spleen are those detoxing. They're taking out those old cells and they are helping kind of cleanse your body. So here's a good diagram. This is also in your book. Yes. So if you don't even have like this, the EP, well, is that like when, when you like someone dies and stuff? Like yeah, so it's no longer being produced. Okay. Yeah, so then it, it's not able to carry oxygen throughout the body. Good, so now we're on to page 118 in your book. This is figure 6.2. This is the production of red blood cells. So when there is low oxygen blood level, the kidney increases this production of that EPO. The stem cells increase and the red blood cell is produced. It's kind of hard to see here in class. I'll try and zoom in as best as I can. Here we go. So that red bone marrow, so the difference between compact bone and spongy bone, the spongy bone is kind of that, it kind of looks like a sponge if you think about it, right here on the end of your uh, red, of your bone here. This is the spongy bone. And that spongy bone is kind of right where the red bone marrow is made. The red bone marrow is then what produces the red blood cells. So stem cells, Maybe you've heard of stem cells because you've heard of like stem cell research. Stem cells increase the red blood cell production and then the O2 blood levels return back to normal and there are normal O2 blood level. You've probably also heard in the news about blood doping. Um, does anybody know a famous person who got in trouble for blood doping? Lance Armstrong. Yeah, so Lance Armstrong got in trouble for blood doping. So the thought process of blood doping is, is you're like, okay, if I have a good amount of oxygen in my bloodstream, I can perform at my highest level. So why don't I put some more red blood cells in there and I could maybe, you know, transport more oxygen to the rest of my body and I could even perform at an even higher level. Okay. While that seems good in theory, blood doping is not very safe. Um, it is a method of increasing the number of red blood cells to increase your athletic performance. Just think, if you had a, lot, a little bit more oxygen to your extremities, how well you could perform. But it allows, and it, like I said, it allows for a more efficient delivery of oxygen and reduces the fatigue. So far we're thinking this is pretty cool, right? But, um, it can cause death due to thickening of the blood that leads to a heart attack. So your blood vessels and your veins are then put under stress because it's like you're putting too much liquid through there. You can also think of it like as a water slide at a, par a water park, right? You're kind of going down in your little tube and that's great. But if you and like 10 of your friends decided to go down the water slide at the exact same time, it's gonna maybe put some stress on that water slide, right? Maybe, maybe it would take more than 10 of your friends, but it's kind of just an example there. The EPO is injected into a person months prior to the athletic event. And then the, the part you guys don't see here in class is that it says it's thought to be able to cause death due to the thickening of the blood that leads to a heart attack. Okay, so you got thickening of the blood, too much stress on the blood, uh, the veins, the walls, um, too much going on, your body is not used to it. So while it has an immediate effect of maybe some great athletic performance, over time it can be very dangerous. So here's some disorders of the red blood cells. The one I talked about was in, before was anemia, or if someone is anemic, you've also maybe heard of someone being titled as iron deficient. This is a condition that results from too few of red blood cells or too little hemoglobin that causes a rundown feeling, tired, fatigue, dizzy, 
blurred vision, not able to function at normal capacity, okay? Most of the time, it's, it's more common in females or people who have a menstrual cycle. And while it's, it's not impossible for a male to be anemic, it's just less likely, okay? It's more likely in females or people who have a menstrual cycle because they are shedding the uterine lining and bleeding once a month, right? And so if this is kind of, if our body is not able to rejuvenate as well after that or during that time, that's why the anemic can be a condition that's a little bit more common in females. So basically, if you like lose a lot of blood during your menstrual cycle, mm -hmm. and that blood doesn't leave the in some mm -hmm. way, so that's how you become anemic. It's one way. It's why it makes it more common. If you are anemic and have a menstrual cycle, then it's just depleting those red blood cells altogether, which is why it can be a little bit more severe. In so, like, so does that mean that the length and the flow and your flow affects? Like has an impact on that. Like someone... it can. Mm -hmm. It just because of the menstrual cycle, it doesn't mean that you are anemic. But you, if you are anemic, and it will affect it more because of the menstrual cycle. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Good question. Next, we have sickle cell anemia. This also has a root word of anemia. This is a genetic disease. It can be passed down inherently that causes red blood cells to become sickle shaped and prone to rupture. So remember that first slide I showed you that weird picture of that red blood cell that kind of looked like this and not like a pretty little frisbee? That one was a sickle celled red blood cell. And so let's talk about this for just a second here. I'm gonna try and pull up my whiteboard. Okay, so we're gonna draw on the other side here. So when something is genetically inherited, maybe you've heard of Punnett squares before. In a Punnett square, you maybe did them in high school. They're like a square like this, and then you put some letters in the intersections of where you can kind of talk about genetic and how something is inherited. So sickle cell anemia happens to be more prevalent in African or African American communities. And this is because that if you do not have sickle cell anemia, but you are a carrier of it, and I'll show you what that looks like, it can have resistance to malaria. So if there's areas in the world that are more susceptible to malaria, there's some benefit to being a carrier of a sickle cell anemia. When you're a carrier, it essentially means that you do not have the symptoms of the disease, but you have the tr recessive trait with you that you could pass down. So if somebody's a carrier, it would look like this. If sickle cell anemia, if you have sickle cell anemia, let's just say sickle cell anemia, it could look like little a, little a. Okay, I'll show what that looks like here. If you have sickle cell anemia, it's represented by little a, little a. You could have two people who reproduce and they both do not have sickle cell anemia, but they could be carriers. This is what it looks like to be a carrier and not have sickle cell anemia. I'm just showing the zoom the same thing. This means that you're a carrier. You do not show symptoms, but here's the catch. If you look like this, you have a resistance to malaria. Seems like a good thing, right? I don't have sickle cell anemia, and I'm not getting malaria. That seems like a pretty good setup here. It's really hard to write on this resistance. Okay, I'm just gonna put that. Okay, so if we have a Punnett square like this, and two people who are carriers, because they have a resistance to malaria, they live to be a, a, of a reproductive age, and they do not have sickle cell anemia, which we'll talk about what the sickle cell anemia and what the symptoms are of that. You have two individuals that do not have sickle cell anemia, but they happen to be carriers. You wouldn't know that you're a carrier unless you got a genetic test. 
you look at the intersections of each square. So far, we don't have any offspring that have sickle cell anemia. Oh. If you have small a, small a right here, you have sickle cell anemia, even though some of these are carriers like this and some three out of the four did not have it. Now, this does not mean that in this order, your first child is going to be this, your second child is going to be this, your third, that doesn't mean it like that. It means that this is the percentage or the option of having a child that could have sickle cell anemia. Sickle cell anemia is common, but it's not as common as you think, especially because um, in our part of the world, the Western culture, we do not have malaria issues, right? There's issues with malaria over a little bit more East, Western, Middle East countries, okay? If you have sickle cell anemia, your red blood cell is sickled. And what it means by sickle is it kind of looks like a shriveled up raisin a little bit, kind of like a nerd's candy, okay? And we talked a little bit about why the shape of the red blood cell was so important before, was we were able to transport oxygen, nutrients, things like that. But if that shape was a little bit different, the sickle cell kind of gets caught in, those, in the blood vessels and you start to have symptoms of dizzy, fatigue, and sometimes even passing out. Most of the time, this becomes prevalent in 20-ish year old individuals, okay? And it's, like I said, it's more common in African descent humans, but it's not impossible to get it if you are of a different ethnic descent. That's why if any of you were, are or were an athlete here in college, they may have asked you, do you wanna get tested for sickle cell anemia? And when I was a college athlete, they asked me, I said, no. But if somebody is having issues with like fatigue after running or feeling like they're going to pass out and this and they haven't been tested for sickle cell anemia, it's kind of important to get tested in that sense. All right. The next one is hemolytic disease of a newborn. This is a condition with incompatible blood types that leads to rupturing of blood cells in the baby before and continuing after death or after birth, excuse me. So hemolytic disease of a newborn, we talked about a little bit in lab about the different blood types. And so this is when you have the mixture, like if mom and baby are a different blood type and how that's affected, all right? So if, we, if you have baby that's an O blood type, and mom, who is maybe an A blood type, we talked about how the O has the antibodies that fight off A and B, or vice versa, maybe mom is O and baby is A, and how that affects the pregnancy, things like that. There's not always complications with this, but there can be. And I'm not an expert in that, I wish I was, but that's just another disorder of red blood cells. Now the white blood cells, they're also derived from the red bone marrow. These large blood cells have a nucleus. They are produced and regulated by a colony stimulating factor, which is abbreviated as CSF. They can be found in the tissues as well as the blood. They fight off infection and are an important part of our immune system. So if you ever hear anybody talking about their immune system, your white blood cells are a big factor of that. Some live for only days while others live for months and years, and that's the bullet point you guys are missing here in class. The, the reason that they have different lifespans is because there's different types of white blood cells, and we can talk about that on that next slide. There's different types, okay, and they're good for different things. It's good that we have different white blood cells, okay? The first one, those are your neutrophils. They help with um, pathogens and cellular debris. So things that we don't want in our body. They're kind of like that cleanup crew. Then you have some that are important for digesting large pathogens such as worms and help reduce inflammation. The other ones here are good for helping injured tissues, um, 
responsible for immunity. B cells produce antibodies. T cells destroy cancer and virus infected cells. Um, the macrophages and the pathogens and cellular debris. So this, the white blood cells are like taking care of business here, right? They are, they are taking those pathogens, getting them out of your body. Cellular, cellular debris, the things that we don't want out of our cells, they're taking those out of our body. Cancer, things like that. These are those, the fighter, the fighter cells. These are like our first responders. So how are white blood cells characterized? There's three um, types of granular leukocytes and two types of agranular leukocytes. So these are types of white blood cells. You can tell the different types by their shape. And with the pictures, you can tell by color, but it's whether or not they have a lobed or a non-lobed nuclei. So in this last picture, we didn't really compare but uh, the one you guys are missing on class here is right there. Okay, so can you see the difference here between the lymphocyte and the monocyte with this blastophilus? This is kind of like a lobed and a non-lobed nucleus. You guys kind of see that one? That one's like misformed. This one's like almost perfectly round. Um, we're talking for Zoom about the difference between those two and the shapes of their nucleus. Here, so this one kind of has like a lobe shape like that. That was a really bad drawing, I apologize, Zoom. And then this one also is like a mist formed kind of lobe shape. And then these ones have a non-lobe shape. They're almost perfectly uh, symmetrical. They have no granules and they have a non-lobed nuclei. So going into detail a little about each one, um, I would say that for the tester quiz, you wouldn't need to know specifics about each one, but maybe the question would be like, what are different types of white blood cells? It wouldn't say, please describe a neutrophil. Okay, so the neutrophil is the most common. It's, it makes up about 50 to 70% of all the white blood cells. They have a multi-lobed nucleus. So going back to that picture, the one at the top, the nucleus kind of had different lobes to it. Upon infection, they move out of circulation and into the tissues to engulf those pathogens, all right? So these are the most common ones that are fighting off those infections and those pathogens. Then you have the eosinophils. These are making up a small percentage of those white blood cells. They have a bilobed nucleus. So that was the one that kind of looked like two lima beans together. They have many large granules function in a parasitic infections and play a role in allergies. Fun fact got some allergies, seasonal ones. Basophil also make up a small percentage of the white blood cells. They have a U-shaped or a lobe-shaped nucleus. They release histamine related to allergic reactions. When you take a Zyrtec or a Claritin, they have antihistamine in them, which a histamine helps fight off infection, and it does that by making your eyes itchy and watery, and it makes you have a runny nose. Those are, it's your body's way of fighting off something, whatever that is, maybe it's an allergy. And that histamine is what's, that's what's produced. When you take an antihistamine, it's preventing those symptoms. So it's preventing your runny nose. It's preventing your itchy, watery eyes. A lymphocyte, these are fairly common because they make up 25 to 35% of white blood cells. They have a large nucleus, nucleus that takes up most of the cytoplasm. So you can identify it because it was like the picture I showed where that you had a circle and then you had another circle on the inside of it. That's a lymphocyte. It's developed into B and T cells that are important in the immune system. Helper T cells also help fight off um, infection. When somebody has HIV, all right, you have a decreased amount of helper T cells. And once your helper T cells get to a lower count, that's when somebody is considered to have AIDS. Fun facts. Monocyte is the last one. These are, the rel these are relatively uncommon. They are the largest white blood cell and they have that horseshoe shaped nucleus. It kind of looked like a, a bubble letter C, pretty curved and perfect. In that sense, it's not lobed. It doesn't look like beans hanging on a string. 
They take resistance in tissues and develop into macrophages, and they are used to also engulf pathogens. But again, these are the most uncommon ones. How do blood cells leave the circulation? So in a couple of things we said here, we're like, okay, we get it. The blood is in your blood vessels, your veins, your arteries. Okay, I got that. Blood running through our body, kind of like a train track, all that transporting stuff. But how do I get that into like my muscle tissue, right? I got a, I pulled a quad, right? And I've, I've destroyed my quad muscle, all right? How do I get some of these infection fighting, these these pathogen finding, these tissue fighting things, how do I get them into my tissues? How do blood leave circulation? Well, they get into the connective tissue through the blood capillary. And as you can see there, it kind of looks like that white blood cells escaping there on the bottom. Um, and it's able to do that because of the contents of the capillary and what it's made out of. The capillary is a different consistency on the outside than like a blood vein or a blood vessel or an artery. Those are kind of stronger. I think of them as like strong walls of a house. And then the capillary is kind of like, I wouldn't consider it mesh, but it kind of reminds me of mesh, right? It's not like a big holes in it like mesh, but you're able to get things in and out through that mesh, but it's still supportive. That's kind of how I think of that. Here are a few disorders of white blood cells. You've heard of immunodeficiency. This is severe combined immunodeficiency, it's called SCID. This is an inherited disease, which means it's passed down from generation to generation through genetics, in which the stem cells of white blood cells lack an enzyme that allow them to fight infection. Someone who has SCID would need plasma. They would need the donation of plasma. You've maybe heard of somebody who has leukemia. This is a group of cancers that affect white blood cells in which these cells proliferate without control. I have a friend uh, who I went to high school with, who wrestled at Iowa, and he currently is fighting off leukemia. And I'll play the video next time. Normally, I played it last time at this term, and I just remembered that I should play the video. But he uh, was an all-American wrestler at Iowa, healthy as can be, has leukemia, and is fighting that off as we speak today, right? So they, they had a Big Ten video about that, and it's pretty cool, kind of makes it a little bit more applicable. You can kind of see some of the treatments that he's going through and things like that. We'll play that next time, unless I have time at the end. The infectious mononucleosis, this is also known as the kissing disease. If anybody's ever gotten mono, this is where that is from. This occurs, um, it's a virus infection. It affects your lymphocytes. It results in fatigue, sore throat, swollen lymph nodes. I got mono when I was in second grade. It took me out of school for two weeks. I woke up one day and I like got out of bed and my legs like didn't work. Like I collapsed, like I could not hold myself up. I had, my eyes looked like I had golf balls underneath of them, swollen. So it was an infectious virus um, uh, disease, I guess you could say, caused a lot of fatigue, the sore throat, the swollen lymph nodes. And I even got it when I was in second grade and it took me out for two weeks. You maybe heard of some people getting it as well in college. I had a friend in college who had mono and she felt symptoms for like a month. She was able to go to class, but like this kind of really takes it out of you. A virus infection, if it gets into your DNA and it replicates, it can really have some major effects. So your platelets, this is what is important for the clotting of your blood. We want the clotting of our blood so that when you get a cut on your finger, um, that it stops bleeding eventually, right? We don't have to wait for your skin cells for two weeks to replenish. Your platelets will help kind of seal that, that abrasive or whatever happened to cut your finger. You have about 200 billion, which your minds cannot and my minds cannot even comprehend how much that is, right? That you're, you, don't, you can't even imagine in your mind how much that is platelets per day. That's how many are made. They have a function, like I said, of blood clotting. They have different blood proteins. And we talked about them. That's a thrombin, the fibro, fibronogen, and the create the clots that form the fibrin threads that catch the red blood cells. So another way I like to think of this is that we have a blood vessel that is punctured at the top. You guys can kind of see that. And it kind of looks like, I don't know if that's a splinter or a, a knife or some scissors. That looks pretty dangerous to me. <laughs> but the platelets then congregate 
to form a plug. So when you apply pressure and a bandage to your wound, right? If you've ever heard somebody say, okay, apply pressure, you know, you gotta cut on your finger, apply pressure, put a bandaid there. That pressure is allowing the platelets to help kind of plug that area. And then the damaged tissue cells release the prothrombin activator, which initiates a cascade of enzym enzymatic reactions. Remember enzymes lower the activation energy. So enzymatic reactions means that this is gonna happen a little bit faster. The fibrin threads form and trap red blood cells. So it kind of looks like that webbing on the bottom. Here. There you go, you guys can see that webbing a little bit better in class. And the, they catch the red blood cells from leaving the body, kind of like a spider web. So this is important so that, you know, you can clot your blood when you have some sort of cut. Here's some different um, disorders that are involved in your platelets. The thrombocytopenia, I cannot say that, cytopenia, the thromboembolism, the hemophilia. I think the most common one that you've maybe heard of is probably hemophilia. This is a genetic disorder. It results in the deficiency of a clotting factor so that when a person damages a blood vessel, they are unable to properly clot their blood internally and externally. Um, this would be somebody who, you know, when they get a cut on their finger, it wouldn't stop bleeding very fast. So what do you need to know about donating blood? So you, you or maybe a friend has donated blood before. Donating blood is a safe and sterile procedure. You will, when you go to donate blood, if you ever do, you would donate about a pint of blood. You do replace the plasma in a few hours and the red blood cells in a few weeks. That's also why you can donate plasma like once or twice a week, but you can only donate blood. And I'm not specific on the exact dates, but I think it's either two to four weeks when you could donate blood again um, because your body needs to regenerate those cells. And then that is done in different amounts of time. Like I said, the plasma takes a few hours for your body to kind of get that back. Your red blood cells and your white blood cells, it takes a few weeks. And few people may feel dizzy afterwards. So making sure you sit down, eat a snack and drink some water. Your blood will be at least tested for syphilis, which is an STI, HIV antibodies and hepatitis. If any of them would come back positive, you would be notified. So we don't want to donate blood and not know about these things because the person you would be giving your blood to could get these different diseases and sicknesses. Your blood, when you donate, helps save many lives. Think about somebody who needs a blood transfusion. Where does that blood come from? It comes from people who donate blood. And it says you should not give blood if you've ever had hepatitis or malaria, you've been treated for syphilis or gonorrhea within the last 12 months, and you are at risk for having HIV or have had or have AIDS, which we talked about. Remember, HIV and AIDS is when you have a low amount of helper T cells. We don't want to give somebody our blood if we don't have the right amount of helper T cells in there. That's also why um, that last bullet point is important. So what terminology can help you understand the ABO blood typing? So we did blood typing in lab on Wednesday, and we talked about antigens, antibodies, and we talked about blood transfusion. So hopefully that this kind of comes, well, you guys can't really see that very well, um, back to your mind a little bit. The antigens are a foreign substance, often a polysaccharide or protein that stimulates an immune response. The antibody is a protein made in response to an antigen in the body, which binds specifically to an antigen. And then the blood transfusion is the transfer of blood from one individual to another individual. We talked about this in lab. So those are a refresher on what those words mean. Okay, so what determines the A, the B, the A, B, or the O? This is the presence or the absence of two of the blood's antigens. And we'll show some pictures here on the next slide. And I also have a picture that I'll pull up from the internet that I think is really helpful. So if this also, um, what else defines the different blood type that you have is the type of antibodies that are present. 
The antibodies are only present for those antigens lacking on the cells because these proteins recognize and bind the protein they are named for. So remember, we want the opposite antibody. So this is like those puzzle pieces I was trying to draw for you um, on the board. Obviously, this description does a little bit better than my artistic abilities. This is the type A blood. Now remember, our red blood cells don't have these little blue bulbs on the top of them, but this is just a representation of what it kind of is like to have antigens. So the red blood cells have the type A surface antigens and they have anti-B antibodies. Okay, so the anti-B antibodies are those branch-like little things there on the side and they, do, they would be able to fight off the type B antigen, which I can show on, um, let's go to this slide, and you can see the different types, okay? You can see how the triangles kind of match up with that B antigen. You can see how the type AB blood here on the bottom, it has both antigens, but it doesn't have an antibody. And then on the type O, you see that it doesn't have any antigens, but it has both antibodies, which you guys can kind of see on the bottom right here. So going back, how can you remember what each blood type means? They are named after the protein antigens that are present on the surface. So those like bulb looking things, the puzzle pieces on the surface, that's how they're named. And these antigens, they do not have, they have antibodies and antigens and the proteins um, and the antibodies are kind of most likely opposite here. And what you can say about, or says, what can you say about someone with type AB blood? Well, we said that here on that next slide, that they have AB antigens and they have no antibodies. So here's the no antibodies, they have A and B antigens. Okay. The next thing is, how can we determine if someone's blood type is compatible for a blood transfusion? Okay. We talked about how you, if you are type A, you cannot receive somebody's type B blood for a blood transfusion. And that's because you have anti B antibodies in your bloodstream and that will just fight that off like a foreign invader. So first we have to consider the antigens found on the blood transfusion donors, red blood cells. So if you have which antigens are on the surface of your red blood cells. Second, you consider the antibodies found in the recipient's blood. If the antibodies and the recipient's blood can be recognized by those antigens on the donor's red blood cells, then the blood will um, clump and cause a rejection. So we don't want to see that clumping. We don't want to see that rejection. Okay, I'm going to pull up another picture here. Okay, this is also a really good reference. So on that bottom part, it says whether or not something can be donated or received. So we have the type A, the type B, A, B, and, and O. That last column is O. This is the type of antibodies it has. Then here on the bottom, it says it cannot have or receive B or A, B, but it can receive A and O. This one can receive B and O. This is a, reu a universal recipient, meaning that it can receive any of these types. And then O is a universal donor. It can give to any of these types. So that picture is fairly helpful um, in recognizing the different types and how they can receive and donate to each other. Pulling back. PowerPoint. Here's another example on the PowerPoint here. You have a type A blood donor. They have anti-B antibodies in their bloodstream. If you donate somebody who has A and they receive A, there's no binding. If you have type A blood of the donor and the person has anti-A antibodies, that means that there would be binding, clumping, and it would be 
rejected like a foreign substance. All right, so here's a couple of questions. Uh, I will leave those here. Let's do, let's see. Can a person with blood type O accept blood type A without angulation occurring? That is no, correct. Why can people with AB blood type accept more blood types than people with OA or B? The reasoning behind that is that AB is a universal receiver. They do not have antibodies that would fight off. Which blood type is able to be used most often as a donor type? That oh. is O. Good job. What about RH blood groups? Okay, so this is that positive and minus, that RH factor. So if you're like B plus or AB minus or negative, all right, this is that RH factor. It's often included when expressing the blood type by naming it positive or negative. People with that RH factor, um, with an RH factor are positive and those without are negative. So if you have the RH factor, you are B positive. The RH antibodies only develop in a person that they are exposed to the RH factor from another blood, usually like a fetus. So this is that example um, where mom and baby are of different RH factors and how it affects the fetus. So it says here that the mom was RH negative, so she does not have the RH factor. Dad, on the other hand, is RH positive, and because it's genetic, the fetus ends up being RH positive. It is possible with the parents above. In this case, in the case above, the RH plus blood can leak from the fetus to the mother during birth, causing the mother to have RH antibodies. This can be a problem if the mother later on has a second fetus that is also RH positive because she can now have antibodies that can leak across the placenta and attack the fetus. Um, this is called that hemolytic disease that we talked about a little while ago. Here's just a visualization of that um, that you guys can look at later. How can we prevent that? Um, women are given an injection um, if they have that of an anti-RH antibodies no later than 72 hours after giving birth. And these antibodies attack the fetal red blood cells that possibly leaked to the mom um, and into the mother's immune system. And they can, if this has to be repeated, if the mother has another RH positive baby in the case that she has later pregnancies. Yes. Does that happen during blood transfusion? It shouldn't happen during blood transfusion because people would know what their RH factor is. Okay. Yes. But it could happen, but it shouldn't. This one is just an act of biology that just happens to be like that. And lastly, this is just that diagram you've seen before of the different systems. We're working, like I said, through that cardiovascular system and how it maintains homeostasis. And we talked about that in the functions of the blood, maintaining your body temperature, your body pH. How can we maintain our bodies normal as possible? Um, keeping that temperature of your body at a normal, keeping you know it safe. We don't want to lose too much blood, so we're clotting blood. So our body's main goal is to breathe in oxygen, release carbon dioxide, and pump blood. So that's your guys' goal for the weekend is just to continue to do that. Hopefully you guys can do that for me. Yeah, is that able? Good. All right, that is the last slide of the day. Anybody have any questions? All right. Well, if you're not in quarantine, they're having that rolled ice cream and I'm going to go get some because I'm really excited. I've never had that before. Um, I think it's over by Old Main. You'll probably see me if you're going to go get ice cream. Other than that, have a great weekend. Your chapter five assignment is due Monday. On Monday, we're going to talk about chapter 21. We'll do some DNA extraction on Wednesday. It'll be really fun. The next couple of topics are like my favorite. Like I did my thesis on, I'm a, like, I'm a geneticist. Like that's my, my niche, fun stuff for me.
if that is all, Zoom, I have nothing else for you. You're free to go. Yep, thanks. Wipe down your tables. Thank you. Okay, so if I was like B positive blood, I wouldn't be able to receive from someone who's like B negative. You could receive from somebody who's B negative because they do not have the Rh factor. <laughs> okay, so if there's but the other way, the around. other way around would not be possible. Okay. Yes. Thank you.